Hey guys, thank you for joining me for our second Playdate tutorial. In this tutorial, we will be covering basic device input. The code that we're starting with here is very similar to what was in our first episode, so if you don't understand it, I invite you to go back and watch that. Let's start with the most simple way to read player input. The most simple way is by simply using an if statement to check if a button is down. Here we're checking if the up button on the d-pad is pressed, and if it is, we're telling it to move our player square in the up direction. If we compile and run the code, you can see that it works. When we hold down the up button on the d-pad, the cube moves. Well, it sort of works. The cube moves, but you notice it going positive in the y-axis on the play date is actually going down on the screen. That's because the playdate draws with a kind of inverted y-axis. Let's fix this by instead binding this if statement command to the down button. You'll notice that we have all of these available button codes that we can use to read different inputs from the playdate. So let's just switch this one to the down button. Now, after we recompile, you'll see that the down button is working correctly. In addition to the input code, we can also use the button name as a string to read the input. Here is a full list of the button names you can use. That's great, but what if we only want to read the player input once and not allow them to hold the button? Well, for that, we can use the button just pressed function. This will only read the player's input for the first frame that it's pressed. And if we run the code, you can see that even if the player holds the button, the cube only moves once. Now suppose you'd rather move the cube when the player releases the button instead of when they first press it. Well, to allow for that, we just have to change it to button just released. Now I'll code a simple script using four of these if statements to give a cube full range of motion. I'm simply adding an if statement for each button on the D-pad and updating the position of the square accordingly. Now if we run our script, you'll see that we can freely move our cube in all four directions. Next we'll cover an additional way to read player input using event callbacks. Event callbacks are special playdate system functions that will automatically be called when the user triggers them. For example, playdate.abuttondown is the same as button just pressed A, but it does not need an if function every update to check if the button is pressed. Now if we run the code, you'll see that the A button triggers the cube movement using the event callback. Just like the button down callback, the button up callback does the same thing as the button just released if statement. Now notice as we run this code that when we press the button down, it triggers the button down event callback and makes the cube move out. And when we release the button, it triggers the button up callback and makes the cube move back. So with both of the callbacks together, the cube moves back and forth. There is another special type of callback that only works for the A and B buttons. It does not work for the directional pad inputs. It's called the button held callback. This callback is triggered when the player holds the specified button for one second. A good use for this might be to trigger a secondary action like perhaps a special attack or charging a powerful beam. But in our case here, we're going to use it to flip the colors of the screen. So you can see when we hold the button for one second, it flips the colors of the screen. To recap, here is a complete list of all the different input event callbacks available to us. Note that each one must begin with dot playdate as I showed previously. As a reminder, only the A and B buttons have the held callback and it's missing from the D-pad directions. Now if we start with the following setup that uses these event function callbacks, you'll see that it gives the cube this range of motion. Now I'm going to show you the final method for reading player input by using something called an input handler. Input handlers use the same exact function names as the callback events, but act more like a single group being contained in a single Lua table. 
Just like the event callbacks, they don't require putting any code inside of the update. You can also use multiple input handlers at the same time so you can group different controls. But you will need to push them into the play date input handlers stack like this. And when we run the code, you'll see that these act exactly like the event callbacks. For some fun, let's add a timer to slowly remove the two input handlers by using a pop to remove them from the stack. To do this, be sure to import corelib slash timer to import the module at the top of the file and call playdate.timer.updateTimers inside of the update cycle to make sure the timer is working correctly. Finally, call timer.new with input handlers.pop twice so we can remove the two input handlers in a first in last out manner. If we run the code, you'll see that the first thing to go is the special controls filed by the player controls. See, nothing's working now. And that's it. Now you know all the basics of the player input systems. Please like, comment, and subscribe.